indeed. Mr. Jim Ross is one of the best wrestling commentators of all time. Mr. Ross has distinguished himself during his 40 plus years in professional wrestling. Mr. Ross was inducted at the WWE Hall of Fame class of 2007 the NWA Hall of Fame class of 2016 and was also recognized with the CAC's Art Abrams Lifetime Achievement Award in 2010. Please welcome tonight's MC, Mr. Jim Ross. about this, uh, you can move this along. My, my uh, goal is to be out here at 9 o'clock. Yeah. Now, I'll do my part, because I have to get my shit in. <laughs> However, if these speakers go along, just move their ass off the stage. Just <laughs> uh, saying. But, man, we, we need to grow this thing. We need to get younger here. And we can't. We need some. We need some younger people involved to help continue the tradition of honoring those in our business. I owe everything I have to wrestling. Everything. And I'm never embarrassed to say that. I spent. I put two wives through college, two daughters through college. I bought multiple homes mobile cars, two divorces, a bankruptcy, <laughs> and owed all the rest of them. But by God, I rebound. So seriously, life is good, and uh, this is always Jan's favorite event to come to. This is the WrestleMania uh, red carpet Hall of Fame thing, which she wear Louis Vuitton. It was her deal. So I think about her every day, and I'm sure she's kind of taking a look at what's going on, so I'll give my best behavior, I promise. Uh, Excuse me, everybody. Hey, Pat, over here. Yes. <laughs> you gonna sit your back to the stage and hope you have a night? No, I'm just sitting. Who do you think you are, the first ever company in champion? You want to be with Asian Arrow? <laughs> Pat looks great. Does a Pat look wonderful in pink? <laughs> he, he liked that outfit so much, he wore it last night. <laughs> Well, who's keeping score? And who cares, right, Pat? Exactly. We don't care. That's right. Exactly. That little box. One minute. I'm going to tap. So uh, let's kick this thing off, get it rolling here. You know, I had double cataract surgery. And here's, anybody else here? Have, I don't want to say show of hands. Let's see. <laughs> I guarantee you, there's a lot of people in this damn room with their cataract surgery, baby. I promise you. I have to. And I don't know what it does for you. I, I, I had it done, I spent money, I had two eyes done, I, I can't see nothing. You're cockeyed. I am cockeyed, Pat. You see, I've got the little reference there, the cheap cockeyed. I've got the rubber on my hat, didn't you? Mr. Montreal. Uh, the first award of the evening, ladies and gents, is for the uh, Women's Wrestling Award. I'm very impressed with this young woman who's going to receive this award. She's very bright, uh, very focused. She's a good hand in the ring, too, by the way. Not that it matters that much anymore, but she is a great in ring performer. So let's uh, turn our attention quickly to the video screen. Since being honored in 2014 with the Cauliflower Alley Club's Future Legend Award, Santana Garrett has gone on to prove the CAC right. Born in Orlando and trained by wrestling greats including Larry Zabisco and Scott Hall, she's captured well over a dozen championships, including the NWA World Women's Championship. Garrett began her career in Florida-based Coastal Championship Wrestling in 2009, where she won the CCW Ladies Championship in her debut match, a title she held twice. Santana also found success in TNA, Pro Wrestling Extreme, and Global Force Wrestling, where she won her debut match in 2010. 
In 2015, she joined Japan's World Wonder Ring and has also appeared on World Wrestling Entertainment's NXT. Whether it's Coastal Championship Wrestling, TNA, Global Force Wrestling, or any of the many promotions that have been fortunate enough to sign Santana Garrett, she has proven time and time again that she is worthy of all of the accolades she has attained over her short career. Past women's honorees include Melissa Anderson, Rockin' Robin, Beth Phoenix, Gail Kim, and Ivory. Tonight, Santana Garrett joins them in the Ring of Friendship as a women's wrestling honoree. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't know who I am, I'm not Lenny Garrett, I'm TNT Kennedy, Kenny Garrett. And I'd like to start by saying it's great to see all the faces here, all the folks that I've worked with and known over the years, and the brotherhood that we have in this thing that's got us called wrestling. You know, it gets us where we need to be, and it, you know, my daughter would look to me when I first started out. And I would go out and do the front and say everything, and I would always make it home on Sunday because I made the French toast for the girl. And I'd be there like in my home, and their friends would stay at night to get the French toast with the peanut butter on because that's what dad did. And I'd be looking at my mom and she'd say, Dad, Dad, it would have been horrible. Well, what'd you do? And I'd tell her to be a few of the risks and, you know, how some of the guys were. But I said, you know what? It was fun. And I'm going to do it next weekend. But I'll be back and there'll be fun shows on Monday. And bet your ass, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be what it's going to be. Dad loves you. And we're going to make this thing work. We're trying to do this thing and get back where you need to be. We, you know, found myself on the road, missing out on a few things. But I would drive 300 miles to get back to softball games or basketball things and try to make it an important part. You know, and ask your daughter who you break wrestlers, and she says you only takes you so far. But I'm not gonna lie. When I worked at, you know, I was, wasn't Captain Superstar. I was different than a teenager at the Playboy Mansion. But, you know, by God, I did what I did, and I enjoyed it, and I knew, you know, the beginning and middle and the end of everything. And some of the older guys that I've learned from, be it Joey Park Jr. or Harley Mace, always taught me it's the beginning and the middle and the end. And with that in mind, I was going and I would watch her, Carl and I, and she'd be sitting there when we were working the guys out in the ring, and she'd be doing the motions and going through them. And I'm like, oh, God. But yeah, years go by. I promote the board, I go, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. She kind of gives me the nudge and says, Dad, what do you think? I said, I think you can do it, honey. If you want to do this, you can do it. Know that you're going to love it and you're going to hate it, but it's always going to be with you. It's something that I was so proud. And, you know, I'm not a name drop, they call whatever. People like Scott Hall and Larry Zabisco extended their knowledge and their time and recognize, hey, this girl can work, she looks good, she's a good kid. And you know, anybody can say anything. I've gone through my strokes, my sicknesses, and always, in my life was in Japan, she made sure I knew that she loved me and she was there. Like three times around, you know, they give me six months, Hell with that shit. We kick out too. We've been doing it for years. Let's do it again. Um, last week, two years cancer free. And some days I'm kicking out. I'm good to go. I'm not gonna keep anybody here hostage. There's a guy with a snake with a tear. I mean he's over. Hello. Over and over with fan guy. I say hell, you say yeah. Do it to me. Hell? Yeah. yeah! There it is. Yeah. And that's the kind of shit that makes the world around. Okay? So when I say hell, you say yeah. yeah! There you go. Anyway, with that being said, I want to introduce you to a wonderful daughter, an excellent role model, a cool chick, and one hell of a nice girl. My daughter, Santana Garrett. Well, I wasn't 
nervous coming in here, but then I actually got in here and I was approached by at least seven people and asked me, hey, are you nervous about your speech tonight? Well, I wasn't, but I made it on the stage without tripping and I haven't lost an eyelash, so I think I'm doing pretty good so far. Yes. My dad touched on um, growing up with him being a wrestler. Um, I remember being a little girl and my teacher went around the classroom asking everybody, what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, some of the little girls wanted to be a ballerina, others wanted to be a nurse. The teacher got to me and I said, when I grow up, I want to be a professional wrestler, just like my dad. <laughs> two sisters and five little brothers, it was rare that I got that one-on-one -on -one time with either one of my parents, and wrestling is what brought my father and I together. I got to pursue him, I got to see him pursue his dreams, train with Dory Funk, and later become an independent wrestler and promoter. While all the way I would help out in any way I could, whether it was selling tickets at the door, handing out flyers, or selling popcorn. I got my start after I finished high school and college. I had my career set as a sleep technologist, and then I began my training up in St. Louis, Missouri. I completed my, fi my first official day of training, and I was absolutely hooked. I felt like the guys tried to make me not want to come back, but I loved it way too much. Um, a few months later, I moved back to Central Florida, my home, and continued my training with the Team Vision Dojo. And I have mentors such as Larry Zabisco and Scott Hall who helped guide me along the way. Soon after, I began to receive opportunities to work for different indie promotions and caught the eyes of TNA and WWE. And so far, I know I've made this sound super smooth, super easy, but it wasn't always easy. I've been told that I was too fat for TV, that my gear was too indie, my teeth are crooked so I shouldn't smile, I, I couldn't be hired because of who I'm associated with, and that I just wasn't good enough. I've broken bones and relationships, I've lost friends, and I've missed holidays with my family. There were moments where I felt alone and defeated. But I, we all have the choice. When we get knocked down, we can stay down or we can get up and fight. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> I don't say that word. <laughs> so, over the years I've continued to work for TNA and WWE. I was Shine Tag Team and Single Champion. Um, I worked for Stardom over in Japan. I was WOW Tag Team Champion with Amber O'Neill, and I am currently the Women of Wrestling World Champion. Um, shout out to David McLean and Jeannie Buss for believing in me. I competed in the WWE's May Young Classic last summer. I was ranked number four in the PWI. And I'm saying, okay, Nikki Bella, Paige, Sasha Banks, and Santana Garrett. That's a big freaking deal. I also run an all women's wrestling school down in Orlando, Florida, the Lady Warriors. Wrestling has allowed me the opportunity to meet so many wonderful people such as yourself and to travel the world. I've done tours in Japan, in India, Spain, England, Chile, Mexico, Canada, yeah. a lot of Canadians out here, and all over the United States. And it has led me right here in front of each and every one of you. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to accept the CAC 2018 Women's Wrestling Award. You know, I was just considered too fat for television. <laughs> just last week. Uh, it's time to introduce the president of this organization.
The man responsible for all this, he also picked up the steak and the chicken. Please welcome to the stage, don't call him Beekler anymore, Brian Blair. join this club, we couldn't carry on without the people that attend the reunions. And that is so important to us. Jim Ross preaches it so eloquently. You know, if you've ever, uh, if you're a part of this business, um, you can read, uh, it's quoted in there. I mean, if you've got to join this club for the moment, uh, take care of the people that paved the way for us. Many of the guys roll on hard times, you know, we've all talked about that. So, uh, last night, how many people enjoyed last night? Last night, yeah. 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 Special thanks again to Brickhouse. Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort to do this, and it's a thankless job. So we have a bunch of, a group of people, we get together, nobody gets paid, we all pay our own way here. We pay our food, we, open, we do all that stuff. So I'd just like to quickly recognize the people that do this so unselfishly, that we'll begin actually within two weeks, we've given ourselves two weeks off, and we will start planning for the fifth fourth. So with that said, I'd like to introduce uh, my right hand man, uh, Morgan Dollar. The executive vice Thank you, Morgan. Love you, baby. Um, Gloria LaBelle. She's put together all these videos for her best. Thank you very much. Keeps track of membership. Um, wow, I've got the wrong notes. I have to go with my, my memory. Uh, David uh, Buckler. Thank you, David. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Uh, Laura Duncan. Laura Duncan's not present, I don't think. He does the ear. You guys like the ear? The way we the poor color. So nice. Thank you, Laura. Um, uh, a mentor, uh, the guy that ran this club for 26 years, uh, who was our advisor and uh, just such a wise man, Carl Lauer. <laughs> this guy is tired of frogs, but trust me, he is our treasurer, Dean Silverstone. <laughs> He accounts for every one of your pennies, and we are very transparent. If anybody wants to see anything, we're an open book. Uh, let's see. Um, we've got Scott Hosey, who runs the Nostalgia Room. Thank you, Scott. Uh, uh, let's see, we've got uh, some associates. Uh, Bandy Weagle, and uh, thank you, Bandy. You're always right there. Joe uh, Shire, who could be here, who was sick. Um, and uh, Matt Riviera, where's Matt Riviera? He, uh, he attracts, uh, he does, he's not attracted to Matt, he's attracted to the that's great. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's a collaborative effort, everybody works hard, and I just wanted to take a minute to say uh, thank you to you guys. Thank you so much to our members, our honorees, our lifetime members, to everybody that's here making this uh, a great happening, because we've only just begun. Jim Ross is just getting wound up, trust me, this is gonna be fun. And uh, I hope you have a great time. God bless. Thank you for being here. That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of Lee Warmer Burke's former son in laws. <laughs> so when I was riding Leroy Streetport that night, he was not going to kill both beef there, he was going to kill the million dollar man. But you told that story. Uh, the wrestling award, men's wrestling award this year, that is going to a very talented man, Alexis Smirnoff. Please look at the video screen. Michelle Lamarche was involved in amateur wrestling as a teenager before training under Edouard Carpentier for a career in professional wrestling. Making his debut as Michel Justice Dubois in 1970, he wrestled in Montreal during the early part of his career. 
winning the international tag team titles with Fidel Castillo in 1970. The two were billed as the European Tag Team Champions while touring Georgia Championship Wrestling. Between 1970 to 74, he faced many of the top stars in the region, including Johnny Rougeau, Abdullah the Butcher, The Sheik, and Mad Dog Vachon, as well as his former trainer, Edouard Carpentier. LaMarche began wrestling for the Funk Brothers in Texas as Mike the Judge Dubois in 1974, eventually winning the Texas Heavyweight Championship before moving on to the Carolinas where he teamed with Jacques Coulet for two years. While touring with Ivan Koloff, he later began wrestling as Alexis Smirnoff in San Francisco during 1977, where he advanced to the finals of a 10-man championship tournament to fill the vacant NWA U.S. Heavyweight Championship, later defeating Pat Patterson to win the title. During his time in San Francisco, he took on veterans including Ray Stevens, Harley Race, and The Sheep, and younger wrestlers Sergeant Slaughter, Roddy Piper, and Jimmy Snuka. Smirnoff spent much of his later career making over 30 tours of Japan Wrestling for All Japan Pro Wrestling and New Japan Pro Wrestling and had memorable matches against Giant Baba and Antonio Inoki as well as American wrestlers Bruno San Martino, Ric Flair, Terry Funk, Bruiser Brody, Stan Hansen and The Destroyer. Following his retirement in 1988, he stayed busy by opening a wrestling school and appeared in commercials for car dealerships and for the Golden State Warriors. He also appeared in several movies during the 1980s, including Bad Guys, Body Slam, Alcatraz 2000, and frequently appeared on the television series The Fall Guy. Congratulations to 2018 Men's Wrestling Honoree, Alexis Smirnoff. You know, I make so much money in the business, you know, I got bodyguard with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Navri, all of you, I am proud to be a Canadian. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, if I took the gimmick of the Russian, it was just, uh, it was pretty simple. Uh, George Scott was a booker in North Carolina who turned around and says, uh, I was giving him my notice to go to California. And he says, you know, Mike, he says, I would love to use you more often. You're a good worker, but I cannot do nothing with you because you cannot speak English. So I says, well, you're right. So I'm on my way to uh, Montreal, and uh, I'm in the plane, and I look at a magazine and I see <coughs> the advertising of Smirnoff Vodka with the big Russian guy who's got a big, big fur coat. So I says, well, here we go. I had five weeks of vacation. So I decided I got to Montreal, shave my head, call Roy Shire, which he knew me by that. That is that it was in Montreal and uh, called Roy and told Roy again, yeah, Michel Zubov will do the job. So I says to, uh, to Roy, I says, I'm going to California, but I'm going to go as a Russian. Roy says, what, a Russian? I says, yes. I says, I cannot, you know, I can barely speak English. And I says, if I go on TV and say, hey, the American, I don't know, good. We are number one. I said, that's all I got to say. <laughs> and they're all pissed off. <laughs> so he agreed with me. He says, okay, we'll try it. So I got to uh, San Francisco, and I was lucky, and uh, Pat Patterson was there, and he really helped me to uh, put me over, and <laughs> finish with a chain match. And uh, anyway, uh, turn the page, and... Uh, I was traveling around the world and see a lot of stuff like we all do. It was fun. It was tough. It was pleasant. You were crying because you're away from your family. But it's a business that you cannot forget. And you love it so hard. You work so hard on it. So I will say to everybody, 
Don't give up. Just work hard. And you'll make it. So anyway, I would like to say something special for my dear wife. We've been married for 41 years. She's the one who really support me, otherwise I would not be her. And she gave me three beautiful children, Don, Chantal, and my son, Junior, who's here. Thank you, everybody. I love you. We'll see you. It's great to hear stories, and it's great that you're here to hear these stories. And someday these stories will be gone. And somewhere along the way, the younger people in the wrestling business have to understand that you have, whether you want it or not, a responsibility to perpetuate the growth of our business. All us old guys ain't gonna be around forever. I tell my kids this all the time, they hate it. But daddy's on the back nine of life. They don't like that. But the reality of it is, that's a fact. So it's something that we need to think about in the organization, here in this room, of getting more younger people involved that actually want to help people in the business. I believe in that. Uh, somebody asked me earlier about the, our Saudi Arabia trip. Real quickly, uh, the Reader's Digest version is this. I left my home in Norman, Oklahoma at 6.30 a.m. on Wednesday. I returned to my home in Norman, Oklahoma at 7 p.m. on Saturday. In between, uh, we had one night in a hotel. We had 36 hours of flying time. Notwithstanding the airport and me and Lawler running around Cheddar without an escort <laughs> was like Jethro and what's that guy's name? Clem or whatever was on Hooterville. Ed. It was Ed and Jeb. Jesus Christ Almighty. Nobody, all they wanted was selfies. I just wonder where Air France is. So, uh, 36 hours in the air. Food was great. Hotel was wonderful. I flew that far uh, and I worked an hour. Yes, sir. Cowboy didn't raise an idiot. This is a real cool word right here. Not because of the presenter, because he's going to get there about 30 more times. Man, when you get to the president by Trump. The next thing you know, Blurts will be tweeting every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so Brian is going to uh, induct uh, Steve Kern in this uh, trainer's award. And I can tell you, Steve Kern was a rock when I was working in town relations uh, and for WWE. He's a man of his words, a man of integrity, he understands fundamentals. He did a great job of teaching the fundamentals, but also respect uh, of what a wrestler is, or should be. And so he did a great job for us. He's very deserving of this award, and I'd like to suggest now that you turn your attention to the video screens. Steve Kern is probably best known for his successful wrestling career, including time as one of the fabulous ones with partner Stan Lane. And as Skinner, while in the WWE, Kern later established himself as one of the most successful trainers in wrestling history. Steve Kern's pro wrestling school was a fixture of the Tampa Bay area, dating back to the early 90s. The Pro Wrestling School of Hard Knocks is credited with teaching many superstars, including Mike Awesome, Dustin Rhodes, Tracy Smothers, Edge, Gail Kim, and Diamond Dallas Page, among many others. In addition to these superstars, many talent agents and other guests, such as Johnny Ace, Dean Malenko, Bobby Heenan, and Jerry Briscoe, have come to the school to evaluate and help critique students. Steve Curran and his trainers firmly believe there is no old school or new school approach to wrestling, but the right way approach. The School of Hard Knocks was dedicated to teaching the basic wrestling moves with heavy emphasis on ring psychology, ring conditioning, 
and backstage etiquette. Heard his quote is stating, this is professional wrestling. Anything worth being called a professional, not just in wrestling, involves long hours and many sacrifices. The school was later incorporated into the WWE's developmental territory, Florida Championship Wrestling, where Kern was president of the FCW. Kern has a talent for bringing out the best in those who put their careers in his hands, successfully helping them on the path to wrestling stardom. Tonight, we honor Steve Kern with the Cauliflower Alley Club Trainers Award. And uh, here is the fitness award to Steve Kern is his friend, the president of CAC, Brian Blair. Thank you, Jim. I have my uh, timer right here, so we will not go past five minutes. Uh, Start. There we go. And, you know, it would really take me hours and hours to talk about Speedo. <laughs> I call him Speedo for a reason I'll get to in a minute. Before I say anything, I just want to say that Steve Kern is truly a man of integrity. He's the best friend that a person could ever, ever have. I mean, I know that on my one hand, I may have five friends, maybe. But I know on that hand, Steve Kern is on there. He is a true brother. Um, his lovely wife, Terry, who I went to junior high school with, or, um, <laughs> it's middle school, no, junior high school. Terry is a saint. Um, she sings at the church. She's beautiful. And uh, if you saw their family, it's incredible. If you saw, if you ever met, Steve Kern's mom and dad, Pops and Hazel. Pops was the only guy, one of, one of two guys that got shot down in two different wars and was captured, was a POW. Seven and a half years he spent in Hanoi Hilton while Steve Kern was uh, growing up and all over. He was uh, an Army brother or whatever he was in Navy, actually Navy. Uh, traveled all over, but uh, he had a spirit in him, and he finally met the Rams and uh, broke in in Florida. And he used to come with uh, Eddie and uh, Mike and uh, the Briscoes, and they'd come to amateur wrestling, and I got to meet him. And Steve became a big hero. He had a big feud with uh, with uh, the Japanese guys, uh, Hattori, and uh, it was a manager. Uh, uh, help me out here. <laughs> Sa thank you, Sa Sa Saito and Sato. And uh, it was one, that was one of the greatest captivating tag matches I've ever, ever seen in my life in Orlando Sports Stadium. Awesome, awesome, awesome. But she was my business partner. We grew up and uh, <clears throat> grew together and I uh, started Gold's Gym. Steve's, uh, we just did a lot together and he became the most trusted business partner I've ever had in my life. So it was very rewarding. Um, more than that, uh, Steve's been a trainer to me, not just from, you know, you think of yourself as your trainer, who is your trainer? Well, I think my tra first trainer is maybe Hero Matsuda or Jack Briscoe, but he hasn't got down in the grind, but I learned a lot from everybody. I mean, everybody at these tables right here, I watch everyone, these guys' matches, and I've learned something, and Steve will probably articulate on that. And uh, that's why he's such a good trainer, because I've seen him take guys from the didn't know this from this life from this watch and uh, turn into superstars. It's amazing. The man has uh, not just integrity, he's got talent and he's trained more people than anybody in this business, more people that have made money than any other person in this business and we're very blessed to have him here tonight. My dear friend, my love, 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 Mr. Steve Steele. Steve CAC. Before I start, I want to tell you that I look through the eyes of faith, not through the eyes of fear. 
I have one God. My Savior Jesus Christ is why I'm successful. So anything other than that, Anything other than that is a gift from him. I've got so many friends here, so many people I'd like to thank, so many people that I've appreciated over the years. I'm kind of um, like the Kevin Bacon of wrestling. <laughs> if you hadn't worked with me, or if you haven't been in a wrestling school with me, or if you haven't been on a card with me, you probably haven't been in wrestling. <laughs> I really started as a guy lost. And why I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep this to just training, because after a 44 year career, I could stand up here and tell you stories about every one of these people that you see seated out here. I either ripped them or I worked with them, and that's the same thing. <laughs> but I wanna keep it on training, because that was my love at the end. I'm retired, I've been retired for three years. But my heart is still in the wrestling business. This is a business you love. It's not like a business you work at. It's something you really get a passion for. I use the word passion because it, that's the way I describe most students that are gonna make it. It's not guys or girls that come and just wanna see if they can make money. It's young women and young men that study this industry that watched old timers like me. I won't mention anybody else's name because I don't want to include them as old timers. But they love what they want to do. And they show that passion. I started in the territorial days in Florida. We had a word back then that I didn't know when I started, but I learned real quick. It was kayfabe. I think the word's gone now. But when I started, Eddie Graham didn't let you walk through the front door in the Sportatorium in Tampa and step into the ring and start wrestling. He didn't even smarten you up for a long time until he felt confident that not only you love this industry, but you would fight for it. In that video you saw there, just on the inside where I put that mark to sleep. <laughs> yeah! I was on a live San Francisco AM show with Stan, and that jabroni came to me and said, listen, I want to go out there and talk about wrestling and what I watched when I was a kid, how it's all fake. Anybody know the sleeper? <laughs> I kind of know how to use it. Well, well, this is what I want you to do. I want you to put it on me. I'm going to pretend I go to sleep, and then when it's over and you turn this, I'm going to jump up and go, hey, look, see, I told you it's all fake. Well, we didn't really get a lot of that video, but I double-crossed him. And when he got up, he was mad, upset. But I learned a long time ago to protect my industry. And I will protect my industry. When I started with him, When I started in Florida, you didn't pay to go to wrestling school. You went there. And like Brian Blair said, Hiro Matsuda was the guy that was in charge of the physical training. I really didn't like Hiro too much, because um, he was brutal, and he smiled the whole time he hurt you. <laughs> now, Brian also mentioned that I'm a son of a prisoner of war of two wars. Germany and Vietnam. My dad was shot down when I was 13 years old. And in being in that situation, I was confused with what I wanted to be when I grew up. I went to school with Mike and Eddie approached me one time at his house when we were working out and said, you ever thought about wrestling? And at that time I was picking guys up from the airport for the office and doing things, but I was convinced it was real because I saw them after the matches. I saw him beat up. So I said, well, I'm not, I'm not really interested in getting beat up. He said, well, think about it. I went to college for a year as a pre-med student. Have no idea why I did that. 
I just said, well, what makes the most money? And they said, doctor, lawyer, and Indian chief. And I go, I want to be a doctor. Anyway, college wasn't my thing. I ended up in the wrestling business, but here's the start. I go to the Sportatorium and Harold Matsu had a deck of cards and we do squats to a deck of cards. Flip a card, do the squats. My sister could have beat me when I was done with just the squats. And then we'd do push-ups, and we'd do neck bridges, and we'd run. And then Matsuda, or another guy that was known for stretching, Carl Gage, would stretch you. I remember my mom coming home and seeing me, and I'd have mat burns on my face. Nothing serious, no teeth missing. But I had mat burns on my face. And she'd say to me, she goes, I thought wrestling was fake. I said, I did too. I don't know what I'm learning, but it doesn't look like what they're doing on TV. I don't know if they're using me just to see if I'll stand the test and be a good dummy for something, but inevitably I got it as I got older. That was to program me, to protect my business, to stand up to marks that came up and said, hey, wrestling's all fake. Hey, you wanna wrestle? Yep. I'm not a shooter, so don't anybody mistake that. I was a pretty boy, and I wanted to stay a pretty boy, but I was surrounded by some of the toughest men in the world, and I didn't ever want to let them down, so I protected my industry. Fast forward, I've wrestled for a few years, I think I know what I'm doing, but the older I get, the more I realized how little I knew when I thought I knew it all. Teaching is a totally different animal because you have to take your mind and retire it back to when you started. First lesson, wipe your feet off before you get in the damn ring. took myself back just to remember those things. And I'll tell you what, taught, what teaching does for me. It made me better when I was working because I was reviewing all these things that I had forgotten. My first student was Tracy Smothers in Tennessee. I thought the best way to teach somebody would be to wrestle them. That was the first lesson for me. Don't let a wrestling student touch you. <laughs> because they don't know what they're doing. I had not that much success, but I had a lot of fun. Because it, we put in the program, if you want to be a wrestler, send a picture, your name, your age, your height, your weight, any background you could to impress me, come to wrestling school. We had the funniest stuff come through the mail. It was like, entertainment on the way to the town. I remember one that was, I four foot 12. I 110 pounds. And then it had a picture and it was the guy's driver's license. And that was because that's the only picture he had. To me, it was funny at first, but then I reflected back on it about, this guy must be really passionate about being in the wrestling business. Anyway, teaching nowadays, it's not my fault. <laughs> Things change. We evolve. This industry has evolved. In my 40 years in this business, I've seen some unbelievable changes. Even terminology's changed since I started. And you have to stay at current event and stay up with what's going on, or this business is going to just mow right past you. One thing I compared it to was action movies. When I was a kid, Charles Bronson, Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, they were my heroes. They'd kill one guy in a movie, maybe beat up two or three. Yeah. But if you notice what happened to action movies, they're not exciting or entertaining unless thousands of people get killed. Hundreds of things blow up. 
Well, that's the kind of pressure that's put on these young men and women in our industry today to outdo the things that not me personally, but my peers did, or somebody that was before them. They're trying to outdo them a lot of times, and there's a lot of injuries. When I took over the developmental for the WWE, Vince sat me down and he said, listen, Steve, you can't give me a good wrestler in one or two years. What I want you to give me is good people. I want good people in my business. I want good people representing the WWE. So my job was not to go out and teach you movement. Because to me, movement is not what makes you. It's emotion. If you go out there, you can make all the moves in the world you want to, but until you grab your audience and take them on an emotional roller coaster ride, like Shawn Michaels will do for you, then you're missing the boat. Thank you. I use Shawn as an example a lot of times because talent can pick up old videos and stuff. And when I would say somebody like, hey, you need to learn to sell, like Shawn Michaels, they took that to heart, and that's how you learn. I can't stand up here and claim anybody that I taught, because I didn't teach anybody by myself. I had help. I had Tom Pritchard as the head trainer at FCW. I had Norman Smiley. I had the late, great, really close friend that I missed and loved, the American Dream, Dusty Rhodes, teacher of promo skills. That's how they learned. It wasn't because that they learned from Steve Kern. Anybody that does this knows this is a learning lesson your whole career. You never stop learning. You're going to learn something all the time. And if you don't, you're going to work with somebody you never worked front with and you'll learn something about them, whether they can work or not, and whether you'd rather work with them again or not. <laughs> I'd just like to say that I appreciate accepting this award and getting this award, but I totally don't feel like that it's all mine. There's so many guys that have helped other people in this industry, that's really what it's about, helping each other. When I said I taught people for vets, to be good people. I worked on skills like manners, respect, passion. I worked on things like that. And I gave young people advice like, you want to be the best like person in that dressing room. You want to be humble. You want to be kind. You want to be respectful. And when somebody tells you to do something, like a job for somebody else, do it with respect and honor and do the best damn job for that other guy you can. Because that's what it's about. Taking care of each other in the ring and helping each other. I can guarantee that I'd have never got to where I was in the wrestling industry if it hadn't been guys that took a liking to me when I was a young kid. Like the Briscoe brothers. Jack and Gerald let me ride with them, and they gave me a lot of advice. And I was in a non-stop learning lesson with them two Indians. <laughs> I was a Florida boy, and they were Oklahoma. And they taught me how to drink beer, <laughs> hit roadside signs at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> I can't tell you what else they taught me. <laughs> Gerald knows. Anyway. In closing, I'd like to say that I miss a lot of my friends. I'm tired of burying wrestlers. I'm tired of losing friends. I would love to see everybody live to be 100, but I guess that's not possible. I want to say last night I was moved beyond words when I heard Brickhouse Brown was here. Brickhouse Brown. Got the courage award. He got the Courage Award because he's fought cancer. My best friend, Mickey J. Henson, last night, he got the Referee Award. 
Mickey K has fought cancer since 2008. And he lives in Key West and he drives 300 miles to do his cancer treatment in Tampa where I live. I've seen his struggle. And on my career, I've been asked several times, who's the toughest guy you ever met, Steve? Who stands it out in your mind as being tough? I used to say this, toughest people I've ever met have been kids in wheelchairs who could have a smile on their face. Now, I've added this, the toughest people I've ever met have fought cancer and other diseases, slapped in its face, never cowered, never bent, but took it on, straight on, and fought it, and are gonna live with it. And I know I'll see Brickhouse Brown here next year, and I know I'll see Mickey J. next year. I have two stories to close with. The first one's about Hulk Hogan. No! <laughs> we went to high school and elementary and junior high school together. I started wrestling first. I used to see him at the beach, Terry Molea. We called him Shopping Baghead. He had the biggest head in our high school. <laughs> he was a bass guitar player in a rock and roll band. He'd say to me, hey Steve, give me a wrestling business. Here's my line. Ah, you won't make no money doing this shit. <laughs> From that day on, I've been reminded that he wouldn't make any money. Now, my answer is, hey Steve, you think I'll make any money doing this? This is what I want you to do. I want you to strip down your underwear, stand in front of a full-length mirror, Take a good look at yourself from the front and the back, cut a promo, and then say, hey, would I pay money to see that guy? <laughs> That's a lot easier answer. <laughs> Finally, I've been a river all my life, and I've got a target on my bald head now. Last night, it started with Brian Blair. I don't know if you remember the beginning of this program, but somebody had taken my cell phone. <laughs> so about the time it starts, my wife Terry brainstorms, hey, I'm going to ring your phone. Of course, my phone rang up here at the podium because Brian had stole it. <laughs> Last thing, when you get old, you stop recognizing people you ain't seen in a long time. Yesterday I saw a guy in the lobby come up to me, hug me acting like we're long lost friends forever. He said, he had a real redneck accent. He said, hey Steve Alameda, went on and on. I thought he was this guy that used to wrestle alligators in Florida, and he was here for the convention. His name was Terry Williams. So I said to him, hey Terry, how you doing? And he's looking at me like his name ain't Terry first. And he says, I said, how's your thumb? And he goes, my thumb? And he shows me his two thumbs. Hey, they're fine to go. Wow! How'd you get that thumb put on? <laughs> and he looks and he goes, What are you talking about? And I said, Well, you got your thumb you bit off by an alligator. That's how I, an alligator. He turned around and he started looking. I really think he thought I had Alzheimer's or something. <laughs> turned out it was Sam Houston. What do you mean? <laughs> That I've had taken enough of your time. I appreciate this award. I appreciate all my friends. I also appreciate every fan that's in this building because one thing I know, without you, we would not have a business and I wouldn't have been married for 38 years to this wife had two kids. And then as happy as I am now. God bless you all and have a wonderful convention. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.
right, I'm with Steve Kern, WWE legend, and he had a big award tonight. How do you feel getting this prestigious award from the Cauliflower Alley Club? Well, when you get an award, the first thing you're supposed to say is you're humbled and you're honored. and Those are the words that I would use, but at the same time, it's kind of like it came out of nowhere. When they contacted me, told me they wanted to give me an award for trainer, I've been in this business for 40-something years, and I would have thought I would be more recognizable as a wrestler. Not to say that I don't want to be a trainer, but that's really what I like the most is the training part because if the wrestler was a short-term thing. So when I look back at it, when they called, I said, well, you know, what an honor to be a guy that actually trained people because people look at you and say, hey, did he ever train you? That's true. Right. Who are some of your favorites that you trained over the years? Um, I'd say I had a lot of second-generation wrestlers that I worked with. Um, Dustin Rhodes, who later became Gold Dust. I really liked training him because I liked Dusty so much. He was such a close friend. I put a lot of time in with Dustin. But he really wanted to learn really bad. And when somebody wants to learn it really bad, it makes training them easy as like putting a key in the door and turning it and opening it for them. And Dusty worked with you in FCW too. Any uh, favorite memory of him being so close to him over the years? Well, you don't have time. I mean, to be honest with you, Dusty was like my big brother. That's what I mean by that was, when you have a big brother, <clears throat> they're not always nice, and they're not always friendly to you. Sometimes they beat you up to make you tough. But the one thing about Dusty's relationship with me was he always protected me. Example, if they said something about all the new talent that was in the WWE, and Dusty said, if you don't mention Steve Kern's name, you're crazy. He's one of the guys that's helping contribute to that. Somebody like that is really close. Other times, he would make me do something that I really didn't want to do. Uh, maybe, maybe a job somewhere. He was a booker. I've worked for him as a booker. I've worked for him um, in Florida as a booker. He got mad at me all the time. I was always late, and he hated it when you're late. I can remember him writing on a chalkboard one time, be on time or be gone. And I think that was for me. <laughs> so, great guy. I miss him. And last question here. Between the Fabulous Ones and Skinner, which gimmick did you prefer? Skinner. And I'll tell you why. Because it, when I was doing Skinner, I, all of a sudden, I didn't have to do so much. I mean, like in preparation for going out for the match, all I did was roll around on the floor, put licorice in my mouth, big glob of water, and go out the door. When it was a fabulous one, you gotta put your sip benders on, the bow tie, you had to comb your hair. You had to be just right. So, preparation. Now Skinner, what I didn't like about him was that I had altered my boots because I had to wear construction boots. I'd been wrestling all my life in regular wrestling boots, and that was what I was comfortable with. But Vince came to me and said, you know what? You wrestle too much. You're a crazy guy out of the Everglades. You don't need to wrestle that much. So I retarded my actual wrestling stuff and actually became more of a character. And I suppose you got more girls behind the scenes as the fabulous ones, both for the gimmick and you're probably married by the time you're a Skinner. <laughs> yeah. My wife likes the Skinner character better. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for talking to us, and congratulations. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Very deserving. A few takeaways from what Steve uh, spoke to us about. One, the, one of the big killers in life in general that I found is uh, to be... You drunk? <laughs> No, he just goes crazy. He is crazy. Is that a fresh Canadian cat? No, no. <laughs> he lost my goddamn train of thought. That's what happens when you get old. No. Never resign in your comfort zone. It's a kiss of death. You're either growing or you're dying in this world. I'm telling you. It ain't like, okay, I'm gonna get to here and I'm gonna just chill. It ain't gonna happen. It don't happen. Trust me. It doesn't happen. Just always live. Have something to live for and get the hell out of that comfort zone. I saw Greg the Hammer Valentine in the men's room and we had a discussion about skincare products. <laughs> <laughs> the system side of this 
Never mind. He moved to Las Vegas. He says, yes, he's one more strike. I'm good with that. He's one of my favorite competitors of all time. I uh, love his, uh, well, you can see through his stuff, man. He was a machine. Greg the Hammer Valentine is going to be receiving uh, the Men's Wrestling Award. And uh, before we uh, meet Greg and his presenter, please look at the video screen. One of the toughest, most rugged competitors ever to come down the pike, Greg the Hammer Valentine more than carried on the tradition first established by his legendary father, Johnny Valentine. In 1970, Valentine began training in the legendary Stu Hart's Dungeon in Calgary. Then it was on to Detroit, where he completed further training under the original sheet. In the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s, between the NWA and WWE, the Hammer held all of the major titles. Perhaps most impressive is the fact that Valentine is one of the few superstars who can lay claim to compete on the NWA's first Starcade, as well as the first WrestleMania, where he successfully defended the Intercontinental Championship against Junkyard Dog. During his career, which has spanned over four decades, Valentine has held more than 40 championships, including the NWA United States Heavyweight Championship, WWE Intercontinental Heavyweight Championship, and WWE World Tag Team Championship. And his many successful partnerships include Honky Talk Man, Baron Von Raschke, Ric Flair, and Brutus Beefcake. After leaving WWE, the Hammer made frequent appearances on WCW Monday Nitro as late as 1997 and returned to compete on WWE Monday Night Raw in 2005, 35 years after his debut match. Greg the Hammer Valentine's hard-hitting style in the ring will never be forgotten. He is a born-again Christian and occasionally speaks at high schools and colleges with Ted DiBiase. He is also part of the Christian wrestling organization, World Impact Wrestling. On March 13, 2004, Valentine was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame by his former manager, Jimmy Hart, and is a 2016 inductee into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame. A longtime supporter of the CAC, we are proud to honor Greg the Hammer Valentine with the Men's Wrestling Award. Here's the uh, bowling money. Who's the treasurer in this joint? <laughs> and I don't know why there's cash in here and a joint. And I'm very uncomfortable out here, so there it is. I'd like to introduce Craig Massey, who's going to present Greg the Hammer Valentine this uh, Men's Wrestling Award. <clears throat> on 13 years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Greg. But before that, my memories of Greg sorted many years ago. As a young kid growing up uh, in a small town, which for me was Homa, Louisiana, in the late 70s, uh, cable wasn't around. We only had a small handful of local channels. And uh, wrestling on TV was very, very limited. Fortunately for me, my family owned the local grocery store, which had a magazine rack. Well, back in those days, a magazine rack was a big deal. Because that, that was our source of, of news and entertainment through what was going on in, in the U.S. and actually in the world. Well, I was fortunate enough to have wrestling magazines at that time, so of course, at that time, in that age, the only two magazines that I was really worried about was one, the Playboy issue coming out. The next one was the wrestling magazine that was coming out. Every wrestling magazine at that time, especially with the new issues coming out, Greg was in every magazine. And many a times on the front cover. He caught my attention at a young age. Every article, everything in the magazines, he was always in these major feuds with wrestlers. 
looking at the magazines and reading them. I mean, him and his opponent always had blood on them. You could just read and see the pictures and reading before a cable and anything was out. Just reading the magazine that when you looked at Greg in the magazine, it was real. Greg was one of the first wrestlers for me that made that made me believe that it was real. As cable and, and, and everything came out, of course, it only confirmed it only confirmed how real he made it for me. Thirteen years ago, when I had the opportunity to meet him, I jumped on I, I jumped on the opportunity. And since then, over the over those years, we have spent a lot of time together, visiting me, visiting him in Florida, him visiting me in Louisiana, bringing him fishing, eating crawfish, swamp tours. But the most most importantly was the the stories. He is a memory bank of stories, and to discuss and hear these stories back in those days, as a young wrestling fan, was was extraordinary. I mean, it's, everybody should be able to hear these stories. And with his father like he was, he had big, big, big boots to step in. But of course he did, and I'm sure his father is very proud of him now. He is a 2004 WWE Hall of Fame. He's a 2016 Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame, which is in Wichita, Texas, which is, uh, I recommend everybody to see as well as the CAC. Brian Blair, there's a lot of, they're, they're doing a lot of good with the, C, with the CAC and the, and, and, and the rest of the stuff. But again, I'm done with Greg, you're a man, come up here, get the men's award. Johnny Valentine. Somebody said the other day, nobody remembers Johnny Valentine, right? <coughs> I don't think that's right. He's all over Google, he's all over every place, and every time I do these autograph sessions, all these Comic Cons, they mention Johnny Valentine, especially around New York, Texas, everywhere, St. Louis, Chicago, my dad was one of the toughest wrestlers ever, and I'm just proud that he's my dad, and I'm proud that uh, he didn't even want me to be in the wrestling business. I think that's why he sent me to Canada at 40 below zero, <laughs> and I met Stu Hart. Everybody knows Stu Hart, that's Bret Hart's father, and I trained in the dungeon, and I caught an infection on my feet because I couldn't afford wrestling shoes, and he said, Great Valentine has rotten feet. <laughs> and I had to go to the emergency room, and they pulled all the skin off my feet. That's how I got started. <laughs> um, my career is 47 years long. I just counted it out. 
I broke in 1970. I'm really lucky to be able to still walk. The only reason I can still walk is because I fought back. And I never let anybody abuse me in the ring except Andre the Giant. <laughs> he used to sit on me. The one match that I had with Andre the Giant, and it wasn't in a battle royal, he sat on me in the corner and he farted on me. <laughs> and the referee said, I says, ref, I get him. Top me down even though your shoulders aren't down. I said, well, get him off of me. God bless Andre the Giant. I saw the uh, HBO film documentary. Another documentary I saw was 3030 on Ric Flair. And he mentioned me as being, I'm going to Greg Valentine's house because that's where my girlfriend's at. <laughs> <laughs> I did like to party, but he partied more. <laughs> he said he was worth 10,000, whatever, and my number's not that high, but I enjoyed being with Ric Flair. Oh my God, oh my God. Uh, and the rest is history. I went to New York. Vincent Mann Sr. said, you need a hold? I said, a hold? Because I was just dropping the elbow back then, you know, he says, you need a hold, we're going to give you the figure four leg lock. <laughs> and that's been, that's been my signature hold, it brought me a lot of success. All I had to do was go out in the ring and go for a guy's leg and the people would pop. And i go, wow, I know how to work now. <laughs> it's all about pushing promos. It's about pushing your ass on TV so everybody out there knows who the hell you are. <laughs> it don't matter if you could go an hour every night, which I did. When I left Mid-Atlantic, all I did was our Broadways, me and Flair and the Anderson Brothers, and the list goes on. So I think, wow, George Scott says, we're gonna send you to New York. This is 1979. Says, you're going to love it up there. They need, they need a good heel. They need someone who can wrestle because they weren't seeing too much wrestling up there. And so I'm thinking, well, I'm just going to be a cakewalk. I can go in there and go five minutes, ten minutes, Madison Square Garden. They come up. So we heard that you are the hour specialist. <laughs> and you can have... You can go against Bob Backlund for one hour tonight in your debut at Madison Square Garden. But you know what? It turned out great. We didn't even throw one punch for 60 minutes. And Bob Backlund, you're great. Came back. A lot of people say, well, you had 41 championships, but where's the world championship? Wait a minute. <laughs> Madison Square Garden. Double pin with Bob Backlund. I walked out with the belt, got pictures taken with it, and then they came and took the belt away from me. And they held it up for 30 days, but I think that counts as being a world champion. <laughs> Andrew Anderson, my good buddy Andrew Anderson, helped get me going in these later years and helping me put my tights on, my shoes on, so I can still get out to the ring. And I'm still going. I had a match for Frankie Del Fabio about two months ago in Milwaukee. It was freezing cold. So I'm still wrestling. But by the way, welcome to Las Vegas. I'm living in Las Vegas now. I lived in Florida for 33 years. And last year, we had three hurricanes, I said, it's time to leave. But I'm originally from Seattle, and I went to high school in Los Angeles, so this is familiar territory to me. I love it out here. I, I love the people are nice to me. I go to restaurants. They actually 
know who I am. They know about wrestling. They love wrestling out here. And we're actually considered celebrities, so that's all good for everybody that's in this wrestling business. This is one tough freaking business to be in. And I'm just glad that uh, I received this award tonight. And now that I'm here in Vegas, I'll put this up there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jim Ross. Thank you, Pat Patterson Worthy. Wait a minute. Yay, yay, yay. And the boys, they're all here. I love it. All right. Thank you, guys. I really look forward to this award, especially because I was a big fan of this team. I like tag team wrestling. I think tag team wrestling can make a resurgence if it's done correctly. Uh, just, like the, just like the WWE's done with the ladies. They, they, they're getting more respect, they're making more money, they're getting more bookings, whatever. So it's a good thing, and I think the tag team is the same way, and this tag team make great contributions to the business. Uh, they're good men, uh, and I uh, just travel halfway around the world with one of these gents. So uh, before we honor Harlem Heat, please look at their highlights on the video screen. <laughs> Booker T and Stevie Ray began teaming together as the Huffman Brothers in Ivan Putsky's Western Wrestling Alliance. Later, they caught the eye of Stander Akbar, who was involved with the Global Wrestling Federation. And soon, the brothers debuted as the Ebony Experience. They quickly rose through the ranks, including a feud with Iceman King Parsons and Brickhouse Brown. They won the GFW Tag Team Championship three times. Stevie Ray then went on to win the GFW North American Heavyweight Championship in 1993. Later, Stevie Ray and Booker T left Global Wrestling Federation to work for WCW. Harlem Heat made their World Championship Wrestling debut in 1993, and within a year, they were Tag Team Champions, the first of many Tag Team Champion reigns. In their more than 20-year career, they defeated all challengers from Dick Slater and Bunkhouse Buck, to Barry and Kendall Wyndham, to DDP and Chris Canyon, and the Steiners. They were Tag Team of the Year in 1995 and 96, and WCW World Tag Team Champions 10 times, the most of any tag team in history. And they each held the WCW World Television Championship. Stevie Ray once, and Booker T six times. In 2005, they opened the Stevie Ray and Booker T Pro Wrestling Academy in Houston. In 2015, Harlem Heat reunited one last time at Reality of Wrestling, where they defeated the Heavenly Bodies for the ROW Tag Team Championship. In 2016, Stevie Ray debuted a weekly radio talk show, Straight Shooting with Stevie Ray, which airs every Wednesday. He is also the host of the podcast Stand Up for Greatness. While Stevie Ray and Booker T found success in the singles ranks, they will be remembered as the tag team that took the WCW by storm and never looked back. Tonight, they join Demolition and the High Flyers as Cauliflower Alley Club Tag Team Honorees. These two men did the work, uh, they become entrepreneurs or something contributing to the business after they have stopped taking bumps. They're good men. And I love the entrepreneurial spirit they have presented and especially the work that they do in mentoring. There ain't nothing wrong with mentoring helping people, let me tell you. And I'm not going to start on that deal because we're running late, but mentoring is a key deal. Maybe they'll talk about it. Please uh, welcome the great Scott Casey who will uh, introduce Harlem Heat. Look at all these fine, smiling faces out here. 28 years ago, and 50 pounds heavier, I walked away from this business. 
I uh, went to Houston. I was Putsky at a school down there. And I called him Putter. So I said, Putter, what's going on? He said, I've got two young men you just cannot believe. I said, okay, where are they? And I turned around and here's these two giants standing behind me. <laughs> <laughs> and we got in the ring and I talked a little psychology to them. I showed them how to hit the ropes, how to take bumps, how to throw punches, how to go in and out of the ring. The same stuff that Steve Kern does all the time. And every time I showed them something, they did it perfect. And I thought to myself, these guys are great and they don't even know it. I said, they're gonna go a long, long way in life. And by God, they did. And for the life of me, I guess I, I really don't know why they had me represent them because I was only with them for about a week. And, uh, but they, the thing of it was, I spoke the truth to them. I didn't lie to them, I didn't bullshit them. I just said, this is what's gonna happen. And I guess it went to heart to them. And I said, on top of all that, no matter how much money you make, it's not about how much money you make, it's the money you save. And they're very successful men, and I'm very proud to call them my friend. Guys, come on up here and get me out of here. Houston wrestling, his name was Mr. Ebony, a black wrestler. He had a mask on. You never knew who Mr. Ebony was. <laughs> he had a cool name. And, uh, my brother and I, we had these weight belts I made, Mr. Ebony 1 and Mr. Ebony 2. And what's crazy is, I still got that Mr. Ebony belt in my gym at home. There's been so many uh, people, uh, man, and I don't want to, you know, stay up here a long time. I want to make this quick, but uh, I definitely have to acknowledge, uh, you know, certain people that's been so instrumental, you know, in my career. And, you know, the first one is, is Scott Casey. Uh, Scott is uh, he definitely uh, is a, a true trainer, uh, a true mentor. Um, Scott taught my brother and I the smallest little bitty things as far as wrestling goes that, that really made us successful. And I don't think any of it had to do with the bumps or anything like that. It was the smallest little bitty things like taking a turn of a problem, um, making sure, you know, we make sure the guy that we was working with made that guy look good. The smallest little bitty things. Um, uh, uh, so, so many guys. Um, Joe Blanchard. Um, Joe Blanchard was very instrumental in my brother and I's career um, from the beginning. Um, you, you, you heard it on guys like Scandor Akbar. Um, Scandor was, you know, very instrumental, you know, uh, hot stuff Eddie Gilbert, um, God rest his soul. He was, you know, so instrumental. And, and, you know, you know I'm, I'm Booker T and my brother Stevie Ray because of hot stuff Eddie Gilbert. You know, he had this grand idea, you know, 
He was gonna create this this cool tag team, you know, black tag team. You guys are gonna wear suits. You guys are gonna be the champions here at Global Wrestling Federation. We showed up, and he got fired. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> that's, 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 that's a long story. We had, we had, we had to skip over that. We we made do of what we had, and uh, we became who, who we are today. Uh, guys like uh, Black Bart, you know, uh, you know, Black Bart. You know, we 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 sat under the learning tree so many times. You know, Johnny Mantel, uh, you know, uh, Mike the Maniac, Mike Davis. You know, uh, so many guys were so instrumental um, in our career. Uh, Ricky Santana, and Cuban Assassin. Where you at? You know, we beat those guys so many times. <laughs> <laughs> now, those guys put us over, man. They made us look good. They made us who we are. I mean, 10 time tag team champions was because of guys like El Cubano and, and Ricky Santana. Uh, so many uh, um, people have been instrumental um, in my career and my brother's career. But I, but I tell you, uh, for this 28 years that I've been in the business, I've been living. Uh, like I said, my brother's dream. I remember um, my brother taking me to the, you know, Sam Houston Coliseum. I remember we got pulled over going down Bel Air uh, on our way to the wrestling. You know, the police pulled us over for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we made it to that show that night, and uh, we got uh, actually got in the back. Uh, 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 Barbarian um, actually got us in the back, you know, and let us feel like what it was. And we weren't even wrestlers. We were just two guys at the show. Um, and, and that's what this business is all about. Uh, guys looking after guys, you know, and helping them come. I got a student in here. Uh, I think, uh, Gino, where you at? Gino, you in here? There he is, right back there. We're talking about, you know, the youth in this business. This kid, stand up, Gino. That kid there, he's been with me since he was 16 years old. He's going to be a, a superstar in the business. He's the guy who's going to carry the future of the business. So uh, we definitely are, you know, mentoring uh, the, the next generation of professional wrestlers. But uh, again, guys, uh, CAC, uh, 53 years, I'm uh, 53 years old. This, this thing's been around a long time, and you know we want to see it go on for another 53 years. And, and guys like Gino, you're going to have to step up and make sure that happened for. Uh, this business because this is a wonderful business and I would not be who I am today if it wasn't for professional wrestling, if it wasn't for, you know, guys like Stevie Ray right here. Because this guy, he, I, I can't say enough about him. He, he let me fly my wings. My brother always used to say, man, you prolific. And I didn't even know what that, that word meant. <laughs> but he always put me out there. He always, he always put me out front. And I, I just want to say, the other day, uh, I love you and I thank you. Thank you. You know, earlier Steve Kern was talking, and I was listening to him, and everything Steve Kern was saying is the same tutelage we got from our trainer, Mr. Scott Casey, and we'll never forget it. The intangibles of this business, respecting this business, giving back to this business. Those things are so important, and I think that's what a lot of the people coming in now, they have to get. Those are some of the things we took near and dear to our heart, even to this day. Because those things are what professional wrestling to us was all about. It was about the show. It was about get, giving people what they paid good money to see. Now, we never thought about us, just like my brother just said. If we make you look good, we look good. And if we did that, we were successful. And apparently, everything he taught us paid off. But when he was talking earlier about some of the things he taught us as African Americans, this was the first Caucasian man to step to us and give it to us straight. He didn't sugarcoat it. And I respect him for that, and I love him for that. And everything he said, happen. He said, if you make it. He didn't say when. He said, if you make it. This is what's going to happen to two African American kids. And it happened. And he said, if it happened, these are the things that's going to come with it. And they came. We was able to deal with that, have long careers, enjoy ourselves, meet some of the best people on earth. That is the one thing I miss about this business. Not the bumps. <laughs> the few I took. 
Exactly. <laughs> you know what I'm on this about that. You know, but I miss the guys and being around the guys and the camaraderie we had with the guys in the dressing room, man. And I will take those friendships. I will take them to me till, till I'm not here anymore. That's what I miss. And every time I come around you guys, all the guys, like Q, Ricky, Paul and Nash, I still talk about these guys today with other people. See, if you knew them, if you knew the guys in the business, the best guys on earth. And how Hall and Nash never gave us a title shot. That's right. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out there, guys. Yeah. Not too late. Hey, Buck, we do want to be worse. We do be for your first time. Oh, oh, that's right. Then you get the guy. Yeah, he forgot about that one. <laughs> but be there as a babe, man. Uh, this honor today, near and dear to our hearts, we really, really appreciate everything that's happened to us in this business and to have a family member walking side by side with you through the annals of this game second to none and i'll take that any day of the week thank you very much I'm with former AWA star and former WWE star, the Claw Master, Baron Von Raschke, who's receiving the Iron Mike Award tonight here at the Cauliflower Alley Club. Award yes! Tournament. Apparently you are, and what, what do you think about getting this award? I think it's a great honor to be so appreciated by your colleagues, your peers, the fans, the committee, and all the nice people that voted for Baron Von Raska. It's an honor, a privilege, and I'm happy to re represent all the people. And the call is all you need to know. <laughs> our next re recipient is also a credit for our business. Not just because he's Jimmy Raschke from Nebraska. He's the Baron, and that's all you really need to know. Before we meet uh, the Baron's presenter, please look at his video on that screen. My man, my man. I'm gonna have you guys just look at me first. Following a successful amateur wrestling career where he won the Nebraska State Heavyweight Championship as a senior, an injury that kept him off the 1964 Olympic team and a stint in the United States Army. It seemed James Rashke's career would be in the teaching profession, but he aspired to be a wrestler. After a meeting with Vern Gagne, his professional wrestling career began in 1966 in the American Wrestling Association under Gagne's tutelage. And thanks to a suggestion from Bad Dog Vachon, who said he looked German, he became Baron Von Rashke. With his finishing move, the Brain Claw, he would soon become one of the most feared wrestlers in the entire wrestling world. In the 1970s and 80s, the Baron held numerous singles and tag team titles throughout the NWA and AWA. While wrestling in the WWWF, his claw hold was censored by a red X because of the blood it would draw. Rashke was involved in many epic matches, including those with Bruno San Martino, where he nearly defeated the longtime champion. He was the first NWA television champion, held the AWA World Tag Team Championship with a crusher as his partner, was part of the NWA Six-Man Championship along with Ivan and Nikita Koloff, and teamed with Hector Guerrero to defeat the Barbarian and Pez Watley at Starcade. In 1988, he returned to the AWA followed by a championship run in PWA, winning the tag team title on two occasions. The Baron took part in WCW's inaugural Slammery, a Legends reunion where he teamed with Ivan Kolon. Rashke retired in 1995, but that was not the end of the Baron. 
In 2007, he acted in a Minnesota theater play based on his life and persona, a quiet, mild-mannered man who created an in-ring gift that drew so much heat and was so real that he and tag team partner Mad Dog Bashan found themselves fighting their way out of the ring on a nightly basis. And with a the fame, there was always a downside. The Baron is often mistaken for George Clooney. <laughs> And because Rashti feels he is better looking, frankly, he's tired of it. Baron Von Rashti is a member of the George Dragos Luthez Hall of Fame, a 2013 inductee into the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, and is a previous men's wrestling honoree of the Cauliflower Alley Club. Tonight, he joins past Iron Mike honorees Tully Blanchard, Trish Stratus, Larry Henning, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Jerry Taylor, and Ivan Koloff. And just in case you need a little more inspiration. Come over here. Come over here. Yeah. 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 Uh, to present uh, the Baron, please welcome Joyce Halston. She is a longtime photographer of both the AWA and the CAC, and a longtime friend of the Rashke family. So Joyce, would you please come up and present the award? Thank you, Jim. I am so pleased to have been asked to introduce the 2018 Iron Mike Award winner. Part of the criteria for this award is that the recipient be instantly recognizable to people both inside and outside the rest of the world. I think it's safe to say that that definitely applies to Barry Von Raschke. One of the comments I hear from fans all the time is that the Baron still looks the same as when he wrestled, even now, some 20 years after he has retired from the ring. Anyone who sees his face on a magazine cover or on TV instantly knows who he is. That is, of course, with the possible exception of those females who, who mistake him for George Clooney. <laughs> if you look at the wrestlers that the Baron has faced or teamed with during his three-decade career, it reads like a who's who of the legends of wrestling. He's headlined in nearly every major arena around the world, he began as an extremely talented amateur wrestler, and he later easily translated those wrestling skills into the pro world. And with the interview skills of the Baron, he exploded in, in, into the, the world of uh, popularity, or unpopularity, I should say. Over the years, depending on who he has wrestled, uh, or who, who he has teamed with, he's been either one of the most hated wrestlers or one of the most loved. Now that he's retired from the ring, I think it's safe to say he is definitely one of the most loved. And one of the reasons for that is that the Baron has achieved success in many other areas of his life beyond wrestling. And that's the other criteria for the Iron Mike Award. He was a, a teacher and a memorable mentor to many junior high students in Minnesota. He and his wife were successful small business owners at a charming Minnesota resort area gift shop where people, myself included, traveled hundreds of miles just to see their shop and buy their trinkets. In 2007, he starred, as you saw, in a highly successful play put on by the Minnesota Historical Society about his amateur amazing and unusual life called The Baron. The play ran for several weeks at the time with never, nearly every night sold out and it's currently in the process of being turned into a movie starring none other than The Baron thanks to the technical efforts of his son and other producer friends. But perhaps the most important measure of Baron's success is the type of man that he is. The type of man who you can always count on to show up and give 100% anytime he's booked. The type of man who has seemingly endless patience 
for posing for pictures and signing autographs for satisfied fans. The type of man who's made countless friendships across the country because of his personality, his integrity, and his dry sense of humor. Most importantly, the type of man who has been happily married to his wonderful wife, Bonnie, for over 51 years. <laughs> helping to raise two equally nice and successful kids and kid sitting whenever he can for his three awesome grandchildren. That's the type of man the Baron is, and that's the type of man that the Iron Mike Award represents. And now, because that isn't all you need to know, please give a hearty CAC welcome to the 2018 Iron Mike Award winner, the legend, the man, and the friend of all of us, Baron. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce. That was a well, that was a great introduction. Um, I am very honored to be selected for this award, and part of the reason that uh, Joyce was selected to present me is because my lovely wife of 51 years, five happy years. <laughs> if, she were, if she were up here, she'd tell you that was when I was on the road the most. But anyway, uh, I'd like to introduce my wife, Bonnie. No. This is Paul. This is called the Iron Mike Award, and it's in Mike Missouri. He was a a very uh, skilled wrestler, skilled actor, a very benevolent man, and uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be awarded this that was named after him, who was like iron in the ring and when he was acting. However, at my age, and after being in the ring for many years, I feel more like a sedentary rock. <laughs> I think I've settled, but you know, out of rock, they find ore. And in some ore, it's iron. And if you process it, it becomes other things. So I just want to relate to you that when I was in the Army, I had an injury, so I wrote to Pro promoter Joe Dusick, having had an amateur wrestling career for, for a while, and I, uh, I wrote to uh, Joe Dusick, the promoter in Omaha, and he sent me back and I said, I wrote, I wrote all my credentials, it's a long list, and I'm sure he showed it to all the boys in the dressing room, they went, ha ha ha, that's great. you know, just for a good laugh. But anyway, uh, he sent me a nice back, a nice letter. He said, I'll introduce you to Greg, uh, Vern Garnia, because he didn't have any facilities to train me. So uh, when I got out of the Army, I, I was, uh, went to the TV station. I called Joe, I went to the TV station. He introduced me to Vern Garnia. Vern Garnia took some rough, sedentary rock, maybe a little iron ore in it, maybe not. He took it and he formed a mold. And then another guy named Maurice Mathurin <laughs> from Algeria by French Canada. He saw me, little Jimmy Rashi from Nebraska, <coughs> get out in front of the mic on the TV station after I'd set up the ring. They'd have me do interviews, practice interviews. And Marty O'Neill, the little announcer, he was only about this tall. And all the wrestlers in the territory at the time were at least as tall as I was. And Marty would, would say, so and so, and 
And he pulled the mic up so they could so they, they could talk into the mic. So they had me come out and I'd go out there, little Jimmy Rashke from Nebraska, and you would say, Good love, Jim, you're trained for professional wrestling. How is that? And then you'd go and I'd I'd go well, I went out and I ran and I did this and I lifted that and I did this. Terrible, terrible, terrible. So anyway, this guy, this guy I never met, came into the territory. Man, I'm a son. And he uh, noticed me and he'd been a, a wrestling champion for uh, Canada. He was an Olympic. He was an Olympic participant, and he was uh, the British Commonwealth Games champion. And uh, he liked me because I had an amateur background. And he, I didn't even know him, and, but he said, uh, you make a good German. He, did, he said that to me three or four weeks in a row. And finally, I had enough courage to say, he said, he said you make a good German. And finally, after four or five weeks, three weeks, five weeks, I don't know. I said, I got the courage to say, well, I am German. <laughs> and he said, ah! and he went to the ring, beat up somebody, and came back. Didn't talk to me anymore. And he, after a couple of weeks, I met him in, out of the ring when I was setting up the ring, referee. And he said, uh, we got to be friends. And he said, I'd like you to come up to Montreal, Canada, and uh, be my partner. Anyway, he, uh, by then I met my wife, Bonnie, and we fell in love, we got married, and in the spring, we headed up to Canada. And I didn't know that much about Canada, but uh, when we got there, uh, I had my first match as Baron Von, well, he wanted to call me Pumpkin. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think so, dog. Anyway, he called me, uh, uh, we call him, we call me Barry Bonner Ashby, and uh, from from that point on, I spoke in a German accent, and I uh, I was interviewed by a French Canadian, French speaking Canadian announcer, and I was speaking to mostly a French Canadian audience, whose first language was French. Although most of them spoke very, very good English. I uh, got on there and suddenly I went from Lil Jimmy Rashke, from Nebraska, to Barry Bond Rashke, who could interview, who could talk on the microphone, who could tell a story. Although the one I've been telling right now hasn't been going floating so well. It'll get better. I promise you that. I promise you that. And this guy, Barry Bond Rashke, will leave Winnipeg, Canada as a future star in the wrestling business because what somebody takes as sedentary rock, takes as iron ore, they put in the fire, and that's exactly what Matt Dog did with Barry Bonarowski. He put me in the fire night after night. There were riots, Mad Dog heat, my heat, Mad Dog this tall, me this tall. A combination that clicked. We got over sensational and uh, like JR said, there were riots, not only getting out of the ring, but getting to the ring. And from that time on, my career soared and I went from place to place as Baron Von Raschka, except in St. Louis where I was just plain old Von Raschka. Anyway, that's beside the point. So here I am, I'm very happy, very proud, very honored to, to have been considered for this award, let alone to receive it. I thank the committee, all the people that voted for me, and I thank for the, all the fans. One of the reasons Joyce, uh, we picked Joyce to, uh, to uh, introduce me is because I owe my career, as we all know in the business, to our fans. And she's the epitome of a great fan, and she represents all of you people that are fans. She's, she's just wonderful. 
And uh, I think you all should give yourselves a hand too. Without the bands, we have no business. And now, I don't want to take up that much more of your time. So I won! <laughs> and that is all you need to know. <laughs> knew by the age of 12 that he wanted to become a professional wrestler. Fortunate to train under Jose Lothario, Michaels made his debut in Mid-South Wrestling in 1984, and beginning with his debut match, Sean impressed all who were fortunate enough to witness history in the making. Following stints in world-class championship wrestling, Sean and partner Marty Jannetty became Central States Tag Team Champions. The two would go on to win the AWA and WWE Tag Team Championships before splitting in 1991. While much of his early career was in tag team wrestling, no one could have predicted the successes that lay in store for Michaels. As the Heartbreak Kid, a name suggested by Mr. Perfect, he held individual titles, including the World Championship, Intercontinental and European Championships, tag team titles with partners Diesel, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Triple H, and John Cena. And along with Triple H and X-Pac was a member of D-Generation X. There were epic matches with Razor Ramon, 
Undertaker and Bret Hart. Though major injuries sidelined him several times in his career, Shawn Michaels always came back and more determined than ever. Michaels won the Pro Wrestling Illustrated Match of the Year Reader Vote a record 11 times, was named the best professional wrestler ever in a 2010 poll of the WWE roster, and was named the greatest all-around wrestler of all time in the Pro Wrestling Torch. Following his retirement, he has hosted Shawn Michaels' Macmillan River Adventure, had roles in two movies, and published an autobiography biography entitled Wrestling For My Life, The Legend, The Reality, and The Faith of a WWE Superstar. He is a member of the WWE's Hall of Fame class of 2011. The newest Art Abrams, Luthez honoree Shawn Michaels joins Michael Hayes, Jerry Briscoe, Arn Anderson, and Kevin Von Erich as they welcome him to the Ring of Friendship. And we present Sean tonight, three of his closest friends, three very, very talented men, two Hall of Famers, and one that will be soon in my view. Please welcome Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and Sean Walton. guys have been on the road and wrestling business know that we're the biggest fans of all. You know, I mean, we do this stuff, sometimes it ain't about the money, it's just about the love of the business and the passion that people have been talking about all night. Um, I had the pleasure of inducting uh, a guy that I first hooked up with in Central States territory in the mid-80s. and. The myth about Sean, even at that time, was when he came from the Dallas territory where he, where he was doing jobs on TV, he was calling the matches to the guys that were going over. So he was always really a, ahead of his time. I enjoyed my time in the car riding around with Sean because he wasn't selfish. You know, he would try to help you get better. Because we came along in an era when, you know, it's fake when you win, it's fake when you lose. It's all about having a good time. and. Don't make the people, like sometimes we were in front of half empty arenas. Instead of pouting and boo boo facing about it, we had the, the mindset of, let's don't make the people who came sorry they came. Let's, let's give them such a show that when they leave, they tell their buddies, man, you should have been there, that was great. And uh, I, uh, you know, I guess the video said it all, Sean's considered the very best. And I've had the pleasure of a lot of times in my career, riding in the building with Sean, which was woo taboo at the time, and going out there and working with him and then riding back out. And uh, Sean, I can't think of anybody who deserves this award more. And uh, thank you. Welcome to the Cauliflower Club uh, 53, the Luthez and Art Abrams Award. I've never been known for my combo skills, my mic skills, so I'm going to keep this short. It's been a long night. But I, I just, I do want to say that, uh, that uh, knowing, knowing you, Sean, and uh, you being my friend, and, uh, and, and, and the things you've taught me, and, and the matches I've had with you, uh, just being in the ring with you, I was, I was a, a, a ten times better. Uh, performer, and uh, and I'm grateful for that, and uh, and I'm also very grateful that uh, that you got hurt and had to step aside, drop the belt of speed, so I could come in and be a part of the acts and take a lot of money. Thank you very much for that. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> 
You know, I did a little research on Lou Fez, and um, I just wanted to, I did not know this, but Lou Fez actually invented the power bomb. People know that? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so without Lou Fez, I would have had four moves. <laughs> <laughs> Shawn Michaels made a phone call in 1993 to Roderick Steiner, who was one of the Steiner brothers, and asked him if I'd be uh, willing to get out of my contract with WCW and come be his bodyguard. And I got the phone call and I said, duh, yeah. <laughs> I'll definitely hook up on that money train. Well, 28 years later, I'm sitting here in Las Vegas with one of my best friends and I just saw Booker T and Stevie sit up here and, you know, it, it touched my heart because, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's amazing to go through this journey by yourself. It's, it's got to be incredible to go through this journey with your brother. And I've been blessed to go through four, this, this journey with four of my brothers. That man right there being one of them. I don't have nothing to say. He is the greatest. I learned so much staying ringside for you watching him and Scott work every night. He's an amazing uh, wrestler, but the thing is, you know, we all ran in that era when you ran 320 days a year. And it was, it was a rough life, and we did what we had to do to survive, and there's a lot of stories out there that we were assholes, and we were this, and we were that. We just were trying to survive. We got through it together, and I'll tell you one thing, you know, it, as JR said, you know, Sean has found peace, and he has, but it was always there, because it was in the ring every night. No matter what happened to any of us, if it was 30, 40, 50 minutes, whatever we put in that ring, that was our sanctuary, and we were free because we were doing what we loved. So, without any further ado, probably my biggest honor that I've done in a very, very long time, I didn't get to put Scott in the Hall of Fame, and to put my, my, one of my best friends, Shawn Michaels, in, in, in the Cauliflower Alley tonight. Is, 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 yeah. Main event, Mr. WrestleMania. Go on. We'll get off to Showstopper, Mr. Mr. WrestleMania, the Heartbreak Kid, the one, the only, Shawn Michaels! This is too funny. Anyway, so this is a, obviously, thank you all very much for this, this award. Um, I'll try not to be long either because yeah. that's one thing yeah, we don't want to do is keep everybody out all night. Um, so we just quickly want to say one, want to thank the Cauliflower Alley Club because I, you know, I understand this is a, this is an organization steeped in tradition, wrestling purity, and for you guys to open the doors for us for is, I know, as a lot of the people roll it over their graves. <laughs> so, I want you to know how much we appreciate the fact that you've even allowed us here, let alone give one of us an award. Um, we know that is a big, big step, and we're going to do our best not to not to screw it up so that we can invite it back. Um, and, and also, again, I guess the only thing uh, that I want to say also is, honestly, I, I, to this day, I've been doing it for 30 years, to this day, I still don't know if I have the proper amount of respect and whatever, all the, you know, old school mantra things that I'm supposed to have. Um, you know, because it all, it's, you know, depending on which, the old timer you talk to, it's different. And uh, so I'm always comforted in that. Um, one guy has been mentioned a lot up here tonight. First of all, his name is Pat Patterson. I, for one, have one of the few people in America that haven't beat you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but I will say, uh, you know, you know, we, if we're bad, I think all of us would like to go on the record as saying that most of that is your fault. Because, <laughs> I mean, he's an old timer. He comes here every year, and he's his, he's one of the worst 
influences in the room, for God's sake. <laughs> Sitting at the table making fun of everybody that comes up here. And that's all we ever did for years, and we got in a ton of trouble for it. And, uh, so just like that commercial that was on all those years ago, where the, you know, the dad walks in the room and the kid's hiding his doobage, and what would you do? I learned about watching you. It's the same thing as you, guys, just so you know. So, for the record, we're all bad because he's bad, right? He's been with that company for a gazillion years, so. Um, thankfully, though, uh, um, I, I do, and I do have to thank him. Um, I, don't, you know, I don't know about everybody else in the room, but uh, every one of these guys will tell you, um, Pat Patterson is, as far as I'm concerned, and it's one of the things that I, I you know, as I go forward uh, in, in, I guess, in my next stage of the wrestling business and, and helping out with NXT and the Performance Center and stuff like that, um, I want to bring the one thing that you always brought. And that is, as this business changed, you changed. And you always uh, stayed ahead of the curve. You uh, never got bitter, grumpy, and all that kind of stuff, man. You uh, inspired hope and joy and going out there and having fun. Um, and, and it is, it's something that you we just were a huge influence on all of us. And I don't know if you ever think about that that much, but Pat, I'm telling you, you are absolutely one of the greatest things this line of work has ever had. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't get up here without you, man. I mean, you, we got fired in 1987 after being in the WWE for two days. Uh, he's the guy that requested that we get, we get the chance, and for the next year and a half, uh, while we were gone, every month he'd go to Vince McMahon and go, how about those rockers? And Vince, they're dead to me. <laughs> don't talk to me about them. And Pat would go back another month, he'd sit, you know, and he'd wait another month, he'd go, how about those rockers? <laughs> oh, what I tell you, they're dead to me. <laughs> Month after month, and then about a year, it finally said, All right, just so you stop asking me, but they're your problem. <laughs> um, and, 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 and then from the time we were there, um, you were one of the few guys that believed in me, you know. And so, and you, know, you hear other people, I, I've heard a number of people in the room tonight, um, but let me tell you something. Uh, if you hear the number, you're whatever, you're too small, you're too this, you're too that, you'll never make a dime in this business, whatever. Uh, take that as a good sign. They always say that to all of us. And, uh, you know, I got one of these. <laughs> and if you guys want to go with it, uh, you know, they, they say that to everybody, and, and, and hell, I don't know, you know, who knows who makes it, who draws it to friend. Um, the fact of the matter is, um, I don't know. I don't, I, didn't, I don't want to come up here and not, and not put you over like a million bucks, because I didn't get to do it with all of fame, and I figured this is the place to do it. Pat, you are absolutely um, I, my, you know, one of my two most favorite people in the world. And uh, I, I'm serious. I, I look back, I think about my career and everything else I've uh, yeah. done far greater things than I ever possibly imagined. I'm, I'm a 52 year old man that gets to do what the hell I want when I want. And so much of that is because of, you know, <coughs> your belief in me and giving me the opportunity with that company that I know I'd have never got if it wasn't for you pulling for me so many times. They don't give guys like me that chance every day. And the fact of the matter is you kept going to back for me. Now let's face it, I mean, I made you look good as hell when I got the chance. <laughs> but, you know, still, you know, they might have not given me the chance if it wasn't for you. And, and uh, so it is, uh, as cool as this is, um, I, I don't know, I don't, I, the thing that I love about this business, honestly, uh, again, still not knowing if it's, I get the right amount of respect, but it's the relationships you meet. There's so many people in this room that I've run across. Darush up here put himself over the thousand bucks city. But I mean, he, you know, I, I mean, I, the Darushes, I, I, I ran into them in the AWA. Scott Casey, my goodness. Scott Casey, he was in the absolute greatest angle in the world when I was 15 years old, him and Eddie Mansfield. 
you know, my first hair versus hair match, and oh my goodness, I thought Cowboys got Gates was going to lose his hair, and he, 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 he managed to open his hair. He did. He did, and they shaved his head and everything else. It was phenomenal, for God's sakes. You know, and, 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 and then obviously all the years later, you know, and I don't know, getting to watch Booker go into the Hall of Fame, and then hear his story for the first time, honestly, Everything that I love about this line of work, honestly, is, is you know, is the relationship with the people you meet along the way. Um, and this room is littered with people that I've run across. Steve Kern, my goodness, I don't know, 30 years ago when I figured I got hired for the WWE, I figured I, I got to move to Tampa because that's where everybody lives. And I didn't know anybody, and of course, Steve Kern, I'll help you find a place to live. You know, and, 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 and hell, he didn't even know me, but he was still just a, a wonderful dude. And and Brian Blair, you come work out my gold gym. Uh, it's just things like that um, for such a really tough line of work and uh, filled with a bunch of you know backstabbing, bitter old sons of bitches. I wouldn't trade it for anything else. In the world. <laughs> So anyway, thank you all for the love of God. Let's all go to bed because at 52, I've turned into my dad. It's time for me to go to bed because i got to get up at 4.30 in the morning. All right, thank you all so much. Right down, shut up. Last thing I want to mention, if you are not a member of the Colt Valley Club, my question is, why are you here? Why would you be here if you're not a member? Why would you be here if you didn't want to support the organization? They have one fundraiser a year. You're in it. You don't get emails, you don't get all the social media stuff, asking for money every couple of days. Never. So, and the, and the wrestlers in this room that aren't members of the Tall Valley Club, do not use the excuse, I don't have the money. They ain't gonna swap. So think about that, joining the club, and bring somebody back with you next year that also wants to be a member and we can help keep this rolling. The club needs to get younger. So I uh, thank you guys for your attention. And some of y'all see you in July in uh, Waterloo for another uh, great event, more great talent. And uh, until then, uh, remember, I said this in my podcast, which just dropped today, by the way, that uh, our tomorrows aren't guaranteed. I'll be something you want to think about. Thank you guys very much. Ladies and gentlemen, have a nice hand. Mr. Jim Ross, great MC tonight. Always great down here at the Town of Colorado Club. And congratulations again to all of our 2018 award honorees. President B. Brian Blair, uh, how did you think the week went? Well, Devin, I thought it was awesome. I thought um, uh, the entire week was fabulous from the wrestling matches, the bowling tournament, the cribbage tournament. Bob Orton Jr. finally won. And for three years, he's come in second and finally won the cribbage tournament. And so many people got together. There were so many new friendships made and um, so much uh, old friendships, you know, old colleagues just hugging and kissing. It's, it's the Cauliflower Alley Club is such a reunion of love and friendship and family and, and helping our brethren, our brothers and sisters. Uh, it's amazing, and it all culminated in the last couple of days with two great nights. Tuesday night was tremendous. I thought uh, the whole night was great. Um, watch Tony Storm. He's an up-and-coming star. Uh, you know, to be able to help Brickhouse Brown, you know, for her, the people to really see what we do with the money that we make, because nobody gets paid. We don't get paid a dime. Um, that was very touching. And then to see our honorees tonight, um, you know, uh, Pat Patterson is He's been an instrumental in everybody's career that's been anybody, anywhere. And uh, I've loved Pat for a long time. And the way Sean uh, put him over tonight, I thought he w I thought first that Pat was very well deserving of that and that Sean did just an excellent job. I thought the entire show was beautiful. I hope that uh, uh, more people come next year. Uh, well, we were, we were sold out. We wound up selling out at the end. So get your tickets early next year for the 54th. Just go to cauliflowerallyclub.org and uh, watch Hannibal TV and uh, check out what you missed.